Welcome to Tough Talk. I'm your host, Paul Terrace, and today I have the honor of having Dr. Jim Hines appear again. Dr. Hines is a Republican candidate for governor. Welcome, doctor. Hey, it's great to be here again. Thanks so much. So for those who maybe aren't familiar with your background or didn't see the last show, uh, tell, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm an OBGYN doctor out of Saginaw. I've delivered thousands of babies. I do robotic surgery, I do laser surgery. I've worked in Africa where I ran uh, two hospitals and 20 urgent care facilities for four years. I'm the former chief of staff of Covenant Healthcare, which is a large healthcare facility in northern uh, Michigan with over 500 doctors on staff and the former president of the Christian Medical and Dental Association with 18,000 members. How long uh, did you spend in Africa? Well, I was there four years. And wow. uh, yeah, in preparation for that, I studied French in France for a year. I did my tropical medicine and um, public health in Belgium and uh, worked a total of four years in Africa. Okay. So you've been involved in a number of gubernatorial debates. Um, how, how have they been? Well, uh, we, we call them uh, town hall forums, and about 10 or 12 of those, um, all of those were without Bill Schuette, that would so they would be with uh, uh, Brian Kelly, the lieutenant governor, and Senator uh, Colbeck, and they, they were good because it allowed us to uh, interact with the uh, citizens of this state and to take unscripted questions and uh, just answer them, and we, for the most part, each uh, forum, we answered the same question. Uh, from our different, you know, from our perspective, and I think it gave Michiganders uh, a chance to see a little bit about what makes us tick and what we're about, why we're running. Who, who organized those debates? Well, uh, various uh, groups, uh, usually either a uh, one of the the county GOPs or congressional district. Okay, and uh, I'm assuming. Uh, Bill Schuette was invited, but just chose not to show yes. up? Yes, you know, we invited him every time with anticipation that he would he would come and interact with us and with the people he did not. Uh, the last uh, televised debate was uh, on Wood TV, and that was on the 9th of May, and uh, finally, Bill Schuette was there. So all four of us that are running uh, on the Republican ticket were together. Oh, well, finally. Finally, yes. <laughs> So are there going to be any more uh, debates with uh, Bill Schuette? Yes, we have one scheduled in Detroit on June 28th. So your listeners will for sure want to see that. Okay. My viewers. Viewers, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so um, I, I know I've run into Earl Lackey, um, who at, at that time was a candidate for governor. Um, I don't think he got the necessary signatures, so I don't think he's going to be on the ballot. Right, he will not be on the ballot, and I'm not sure exactly the reasoning. Okay. Um, but w was there a reason why he was not in invited to participate? Do you know? You know, I don't know. Uh, I was open to whoever. I, I just wanted to participate just because I wanted to be out there. As you know, I'm an outsider. I've never run for political office before, and so I felt also just getting out to where the people are was very important. And so uh, I'm not sure where the invitations actually uh, came from, but uh, whenever we received one, you know, I, I changed my schedule and I was there. Okay. So um, wh what are some of the major issues you see facing uh, Michigan? We have a lot of issues. And uh, I, I would preface that we've made a lot of progress under Governor Snyder, but. Uh, the, the main categories, I believe, are uh, jobs, education, and infrastructure, and I'm laser-focused on those areas, and in particular, no-fault auto insurance, uh, the fact that we have such a low reading uh, level in this state uh, is very disturbing, and then, of course, our roads are crumbling and falling apart. Okay. Um, what would one of, you know, some of your solutions be for the roads? Well, um, 
I think the, the main thing to realize is that it's possible to fix our roads without increasing the taxes. That's good to hear. So that's good. <laughs> we have to use good quality material. We have to use material that will last a long time, that will have uh, not as much maintenance uh, requirements. But also we need to fix our potholes when they're small. It's like when you go to the dentist and you have a cavity. Uh, the, the dentist always wants a small cavity because there's less damage to the whole tooth, so you're not losing the tooth. And you grind it out, you clean it out, you coat it, you put the right stuff in it, you pack it in, and then you make it level with the rest of the tooth. That's how we need to fix the potholes in this state. And I'm sure we have a billion potholes. Some of them are huge, some of them are small, some of them just from season to season, they don't get fixed and they just get bigger. And so uh, it's very expensive to tear a road apart, put the foundation in and so forth. And so I think part of the, the solution is fixing the roads uh, early on and uh, using the funds that have been designated for the roads for the roads and using uh, any lapse funds from the prior year, extra money that was left over, those lapse funds, to target the roads and anything in the general fund. So. Uh, but it has to be a priority. Okay. Um, there's a lot of talk about recreational marijuana. Um, if the legislature doesn't pass the bill, it's going to be on the ballot in November. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are looking at the taxes that could be generated by taxing mm -hmm. legalized marijuana. Um, first of all, what, what's your opinion of recreational marijuana? Let me, Paul, let me start off by saying that I do support medical marijuana. And uh, it's primarily because I've seen it work over and over again in my patients. The CBD component particularly is very helpful for a number of illnesses. Um, and so I've seen it work. I've seen patients go off five medications and just use the, the CBD part of the, of the marijuana and it be successful. The, the issue with recreational marijuana, I believe, is that we don't really know how it it interacts with other medications like heart medication or this or that. We don't know the proper dose. We don't know the instance of lung cancer, for example. So there's a lot of things we don't know about marijuana. And, and to legalize it, uh, noting that it is uh, federally illegal, but to legalize it as a state, I, th I believe that we need more research to really show, we, we know it helps medically, and even then we still need to regulate it well, but we need more research uh, for recreational marijuana before I would uh, myself agree to, to legalize it. Now once it's legalized, if it is legalized in November, then I think that we, we need to deal with it and there are certain precautionary things that we need to do. Okay. Up until 1913, it was legal marijuana in all uh, states of, mm -hmm. of the country. So. Um, I've heard all every kind of rationale for <laughs> legalizing it, but you know, um, think about it. Uh, if you're a, a parent and you have young children that go to daycare, would you want the caregiver to be on marijuana taking care of your small children? Would you want the bus driver for your kids taking them to school on marijuana? We know that it has an effect on memory and thinking and ability to uh, do things rapidly and what would be the effect on jobs and so there are issues that would have to be dealt with uh, how, how do the policemen deal with it when they stop someone for speeding you know um, are they under the influence of marijuana or are they just have some in their system so there there's some significant issues there there certainly are issues um, obviously you would think in partaking in it, you would act responsibly. No one's saying, you know, don't act responsibly. Just like somebody, you know, you wouldn't want it, your kids with a person who's drunk. You know, you wouldn't want to. Well, you, you would think so, Paul, but you know, I, I've had dozens, probably over a hundred moms pregnant, early pregnancy. They have the nausea of the pregnancy and they take marijuana. And, um, they believe that it's okay, it's not gonna hurt anything, and I, and you know, we have a little discussion about, well, it really, we really don't know what the effect is gonna be on that unborn baby that has, you know, is developing its brain and heart and so forth, and so I take all my pregnant moms off marijuana immediately, and you would think, well, common sense would say, you're, you're gonna be off drugs while you're pregnant, but patients need guidance. You know, they need guidance, and the common sense kind of goes out the window sometimes. Okay. 
Well, let's move on to, uh, you know, big issue is the no-fault auto, auto insurance. Um, and the, uh, I think, is it June 1st, the Michigan catastrophic uh, portion is going up to $192 per car. Right. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I think the auto insurance is way too high. It's the most expensive in Michigan. I think that it's it's keeping families from coming to Michigan because it's so costly, and it's it's um, when when families have a choice, they leave Michigan because the insurance is cheaper elsewhere. Um, both Democrats and Republicans agree that there's a tremendous amount of fraud involved in our no-fault auto insurance, and so I, I think that the first thing to deal with is developing an agency, a fraud agency, to find where that fraud is and get rid of it, and that will bring costs down. Um, the second thing is I, I believe we need a fee schedule. A uh, fee schedule would be that uh, whether you're in an auto accident or not in an auto accident, the services that you require would be the same price. So for example, let's say you developed a cough and I wrote your prescription to go get a chest x-ray. It's going to cost maybe $65. But if you left the studio and went out and you were in an auto accident, went to the emergency room and you had the same chest x-ray, it's over $600. That makes absolutely no sense. And so I would start with those two things. I wouldn't deal with the caps. I wouldn't deal with a lot of other things because I, I think that that's been some of the problem over the last you know, 20, 30 years. And frankly, when you look at those that are running against me, uh, th they have lots of ideas on how to decrease that cost of no-fault insurance. And I look at them and I say, well, what have you been doing the last you know, 8, 12, and 34 years? Because no-fault came in the mid-70s. Uh, you know, why haven't you dealt with this? Uh, I think one of the reasons is is because the the packages contain too many components, and I think if we just will look at one or two at a time, we can get that common sense uh, legislation passed and start making a dent in getting those costs down. Okay. Now you also mentioned an important issue: education. Uh, w what are your thoughts on that? That's a that's a that's a big topic because I, I believe that the the education of our populace is the foundation of everything else in this state. Uh, it's more important than jobs. It's more important than infrastructure. It's education because the more education you have, the better job you can get. The more talent that you have, um, we have way too many kids who are not learning to read, and too many kids that are not ready for college or trade school when they when they graduate from high school and yeah. we need to stop pushing kids to college um, our vocational trades are in trouble but back to the education um, I, I believe that we need local control uh, that we need school choice I would get rid of Common Core I believe we need to go back to the basics of reading writing and arithmetic and in addition to the basics um, things like integrity and honesty, those types of things that are maybe not so much learned in families nowadays because of the broken family. So back to the basics completely. I believe that we need reading coaches in the school. When you and I grew up, we had parents that read to us, we read to them, but we have so many single parent families and dysfunctional families that are busy that kids are not reading at home. They are not reading at home and so we need to be able to have grandpas and grandmas and moms and dads, volunteers come into our schools one-on-one, one, one on two, and read with kids. Uh, read with kids. And then we need a, a coordinated system so that when you have a three and four-year-old all the way up to K-3, you have a, a continuity between one year and the next. I, I believe that continuity is important. I believe that our teachers need specialized education on how to teach kids to read. We cannot assume that every teacher knows how kids learn to read. And fourthly, um, I think that we have to have a, uh, some sort of teaching program. My, um, my two oldest sons, I ha we have seven sons, my two oldest sons are doctors. When we were in Africa, my job was to homeschool them in the reading department. And so I taught my two oldest sons how to read using phonics, you know, the A, E, I, O, and U. And, um, and it was successful. And uh, my dad, my father, he only went to third grade. And I, when I discovered that he couldn't read, 
I use phonics to teach him to read also, and so I'm a really strong proponent of phonics, but we need a system that's consistent uh, to teach these kids how to read. Okay. W what are your thoughts on uh, charter schools and specifically, uh, I hear a lot of people saying, well, uh, one of the um, Democratic candidates, he says, we have to end for-profit charter schools. So hmm. Hmm. Um, what, what are your thoughts on charter well, Paul, schools? Well, Paul, I, I have visited uh, non-for-profit and profit charter schools. I love charter schools. When you look at, when you look at how they do with the testing, they're doing better. They do, they do better than the traditional public schools in reading, math, and almost every area, even though the charter schools have, you know, they have a lottery system if there's a backlog of people that want to, kids that want to come, but they pretty much just take everybody. Um, I like charter schools because I like choice. The, our kids do not belong to the government. Our kids belong to parents, and parents know their children, and I have many families that I take care of where they could have all their kids in one school, but they choose not to. They may have one in a charter school, one in a traditional public school, and, and one in uh, uh, another school even. We, we as a family, we homeschooled in Africa. We've had our kids in the traditional public schools. We've had them in parochial schools and Christian schools associated with the church. And not all of our kids did the same thing. Our seventh son has Down syndrome, and he started out in a traditional public school, but we moved him to a special needs school. And so I think choice is important. And uh, if a school can, can meet all their obligations and make some money to boot, I see nothing wrong with that. Okay. Um, now now you, you mentioned jobs. Um, how, how do you see the government uh, creating jobs? I, I think uh, the government can foster the atmosphere for jobs, but really people create jobs. You know, entrepreneurs uh, in particular. I love entrepreneurs because they have a, a dream and a vision and, and they step out and take risks to start new businesses. And there are thousands of those all over the state. So I would never say, well, the government creates jobs. I believe people create jobs. Um, but there are things that we can do to foster the businesses that we have here in the state of Michigan. And a number of those are keeping taxes and regulations and spending under control. Um, and decreasing taxes and regulations whenever we can. And to get rid of as many regulations as we can. And when we do that, that causes, that's like taking uh, uh, the handcuffs off of small business owners. They can hire more employees, they can raise salaries, they can uh, build on, they can expand, they can create another business. And uh, so that's critically important. Uh, right now we have a, a workforce uh, shortage. Employers are screaming for workers. As you know, our unemployment rate is, is really low. And uh, there was a time it was as low as it's ever been in 17 years, so it's, it's low. But um, we have a lot of job openings right now, but we don't have the workers that have the skill to take those jobs. Uh, in particular, we're short over 100,000 uh, skilled trade positions. And so that's one of the things I would do is I would bring back vocational trades training and respect. And to do that, because we don't have the instructors, we would need to have some sort of alternative certification. So for example, a plumber that has 4,000 hours or more in work could come in and actually do some instruction to, to build up our workforce. But I think what I see as I travel around the state, I see manufacturing bringing in individuals, doing on-the-job training, and uh, making sure this is someone they want to invest in, and, and then even send them off to trade school or wherever they need to go to get the training that they need if they don't offer it at, at that facility, and bringing them back in. And of course, um, apprenticeships, scholarships, internships. My fifth son works for Microsoft in the state of Washington. I'd like, I, I, five of my kids with all my grandchildren live outside of Michigan. I'd love to bring them back, but Microsoft was so strategic because they offered him an internship. He graduated with his master's uh, in, at Michigan, and uh, so they offered him an internship for the summer, paid him a lot of money, you know, and they wanted him to sign on the dotted line after, after the summer, but he said, no, no, you know, I need to go back to school. I really want to get my master's. Next summer, they called him again, 
And uh, by the, the time he went through two, two internships with Microsoft, he signed on the dotted line and you know he's in the state of Washington. So um, internships and scholarships I think are especially two avenues where businesses can uh, have an individual come to their business and explore and see and then sign on. And uh, so those are just a couple of the things. And of course, I, I, I really think that all able-bodied people need to be working. Okay. Uh, just today, the Civil Rights Commission um, said they were going to uh, start accepting complaints based upon uh, a violation of your sexual orientation uh, being the LBGTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, now, these are you know unelected officials who have expanded the law. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on the LGBT um, issue and of course uh, ethnicity and religion and so forth is that we should not discriminate. And uh, if you're open for business, you're open for business, you're open for commerce. And uh, regardless of one's race, gender, uh, ethnicity, or religion, uh, you should be open to business. And uh, that includes uh, employees, too. And uh, in, ad in addition, you know, I, over, over the years, I've had uh, hundreds of patients that would fall in that category as, as les lesbians and so forth, so I've done, and transgender, so I've done a lot of counseling and work with uh, individuals that fall in that category of the LGBTQ. Okay. Um, but these, you know, the law does not cover these people, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, a commission, an elected body, decided to extend it. Don't you think this, this should have gone to the legislature? I would think so. I would think so, um, because that should decrease issues and problems. Okay. Um, are there, well, l l let me, you may not want to comment on this, but there's been a, um, a kind of an uproar about some comments that Senator Pat Kolbeck made regarding the Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and uh, the Muslim uh, candidate for governor. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comments on that? Ah, yeah, thanks, Paul. <laughs> yes, I was at the Michigan press conference uh, when uh, there was a heated exchange between uh, Patrick Kolbeck and uh, Al Sahid uh, about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and some accusations and so forth. I, I guess what I would say is I would not at all ever discriminate based on religion or faith. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're America. We have the freedoms that we have, and we treasure those freedoms. And uh, we all came as immigrants, but we're not immigrants now. We are Americans. We are Americans. And uh, I accept you for whatever faith you are, whether you're atheist or you're Muslim or you're Christian or you're Jewish or whatever. And uh, so I think that, that that's, that's an important part of being an American is being open. Um, I, th I think the concern is when you think maybe uh, someone has snuck across the border, an illegal immigrant or somebody that is here illegally in particular that will harm you or your family or your neighbors. And uh, so sometimes I think that we get confused um, because anybody with any type of religion or skin color can come here illegally. And I'm for strong vetting, very strong vetting, and a very strong wall, really because of my experiences in Africa. And um, that, that there should not be discrimination based on one's uh, faith or religion. Uh, it should be, you know, everybody else is waiting in line. Why are you sneaking across the border? And are you coming here to harm us? And we don't need that nonsense. Okay. Now, a as a doctor, I'm going to... Uh, deferred to your opinion, um, I've heard that, you know, some of, especially maybe among the illegal uh, immigrant community, that uh, we're seeing an increase in diseases that uh, we once thought were um, not present here in America. 
Um, what are your thoughts on? Well, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, as you know, I, not only did I work in Africa for four years, but I have led dozens of medical teams all over the world to Vietnam, Cambodia, Romania, Central America, South America, many countries in Africa. And uh, when you're in those places, you see diseases that we haven't seen here for years. You know, leprosy and tuberculosis and uh, uh, certain sexually transmitted diseases and uh, all kinds of unusual uh, presentations of disease and uh, so it's true and so physicians here in the United States they have studied those diseases in medical school but they've not ever seen a case and this can be particularly dangerous not only for uh, illegal immigrants or immigrants or refugees but also missionaries who go and work in another country and then come back here, here to the United States there's been many cases where uh, for example, uh, a patient has malaria, which is transmitted by a mosquito, and come to the United States and get deathly sick and die, and the physician's not even aware that malaria was an option uh, in the diagnosis. And so it is true that uh, there are certain things that can be brought here, but not anything that physicians, physicians in Michigan or in the United States wouldn't be able to take care of. They just have to be alert to that. Okay. Um. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, I, before the show, you uh, showed me some very creative videos on your website. So wh what is your website? The website is um, www.heinzformichigan.com. So Heinz, the number four, Michigan.com. And if your viewers want, we've put up three animations so far in the last week and a half. The first one is defining what a career politician is because I'm running against three, three politicians that are term limited. Two of them are career politicians, but all three say they're not career politicians. So we thought we'd put up an animation. It's just one minute long on what is a career politician. The second animation is on the swamp. Who's in the swamp? And a very fascinating. And the third one is on roads. Okay. Well, with that, we'll have to end it, but I wish you luck, and hopefully I'll see you again. Great. Thanks Thank so much, you. Paul.